good you are, I don't care how talented you are, I don't care how much you work on yourself, there are some times when things aren't going to go right. There are times when anything that can happen will happen. Life happens. The unexpected, the uncalled for, the unintentional. We've been damaged emotionally, damaged spiritually. It may be your business. It may be your heart that is broken today. It may be the number in your bank account that is screaming, you are broke. You can break physically, you can break mentally, you can break your heart, you can break your spirit, and all of those are gonna leave a mark. But the mark that they leave can be the mark of victory or it can be the mark of defeat. It is staying with the breaking that produces the blessing. It is not what you go through that determines where you end up. It's who you listen to. Because I think right now, you are walking through a valley between two voices. One is wisdom, one is worry. One is gratitude, one is grumbling. One is blame, one is faith. Because Every time you break, and in every way that you break, while well, it's a chance for you to give up and for you to fall apart, but there's also opportunity to get stronger and get smarter and get faster and get tougher and get more stable and get more resilient and get better. What I need you to do is I need you to find a reason to keep going. And if you can find a reason to keep going, I know you're strong enough to do it because you're human. And every human has what it takes to get past whatever they're going through if they decide to. Push through it. Push through it. Tragedy and trials come to everybody. Only the strong survive. The fight isn't over. The fight is just beginning. You have the opportunity to show the world what you are really made of. I need you to look at that sickness that's going on in your life right now, whatever it is. I want you to say, I can beat it. I can beat it. I will beat it. I must. I got a family to live for. I ain't through yet. My life ain't over yet. There's some things in life you don't need no degree for. You don't need no money for it. You don't need no support for it. There's something in life you're just going to get through when you tell yourself, I'm going to get through this. Regardless of what happens to your life, regardless of the adversity, regardless of the opposition, regardless of the trial and tribulation, nothing can stop you. The only thing that can stop you is you. No situation, no circumstance, no piece of adversity can define your life. Never let a circumstance define you. And I'm not retreating. I'm not running. I don't care what they say on paper. I don't care if you say we outnumbered. We live by this and we die by this. We don't retreat. We don't run. We gonna stand, we gonna live, we gonna die by what we stand for and everybody gonna know what we represent and what we're a part of. I got staying power. I got staying power. Be encouraged today that no matter what you walk through, no matter how broken your marriage is, no matter how many times you failed, there is within you a spirit that is greater than whatever is going on around you. And as you crawl up and out of that dismal and wretched place, as you rise above what you were, and as you take the form of who you are supposed to be, you will see that in the very act of standing up, in the very act of fighting on, you will become and you will remain unbroken. Amen. Amen. There, there, there's a lot in that, um, but I figured that it was good to uh, remind you all of what we are talking about. We are talking about hope. We are in a series called Hope. And so today, as we get into more of what hope truly is, I wanted to share that, to remind yourself that no matter what you're going through, it's not over. 
And it's not over until we stand face to face with Jesus. Amen? Amen. And so um, I, just a reminder to keep moving forward. And as, as I was kind of uh, into this mode, I, 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 I just keep moving forward, that, that thought process. Um, I started reading a bunch of stories uh, this last week. And, uh, I, and obviously it was Thanksgiving this last week, and so what are you thankful for? And all this kind of stuff was going on. And I, I just started reading stories of hope and, and stories um, that are just encouraging. And I, I got to this one, and actually, um, it, I, it, because I don't do martial arts and I don't go to a dojo and I don't have a sensei, um, I didn't know this story, but there is uh, this story um, about a 10 year old boy. This 10 year old boy uh, got into a tragic accident. And during that tragic accident, he ended up losing his left arm. And as a, as a younger boy, um, learning to try to do life with, with missing a limb, he saw a dojo and he said, you know what? I can do that. I can do that. Now, he went into uh, judo, and in judo, there is a lot of defensive moves. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of throws that take place. And to be honest with you, you need kind of both of your arms. And so he went up to the sensei, and he said, can you train me? Is, is it even possible? And the sensei looked at him and said, of course. He goes, this is what I want you to do. And he taught him this one move. It's actually this one throw that he's supposed to do. And, and so the, 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 the 10-year-old boy started practicing this move. He would go to the dojo almost every day. And, the, and he would ask the sensei, sensei, what do I learn now? And he showed him the same move over and over again. And all I as I'm reading the story, all, I, all I'm thinking is karate kid, paint the fence. You know, watch the car. Like, and then I'm sitting there and I'm reading this and he's like, same move over and over again. Now, there are some other boys that started with him at the exact same time and they're learning multiple moves. They're learning like four or five or six different moves. And every time he goes to the sensei, he's getting kind of frustrated. He says, how come I can't learn these moves? And he says, I want you to learn this one move because this will be the only move you will ever need to know. And the boy sat back and, and, and instead of getting frustrated and quitting, he says, all right, fine. So he did, he practiced. Day after day, week after week, month after month. And then finally, the sensei says, I'm putting you in a tournament. And the kid freaks out. A tournament? I know one move. That's it. I know one move. And so he's kind of like, has this anxiety about what he's like, how am I going to do this? And sure enough, he gets to his first match. Totally wins. Easy. Pins the guy. Done. Second match. Easy. Third match. Easy. Fourth match. A little bit tougher. But pins the guy. Totally done. And he's sitting back and he's blown away. And he says, I cannot believe that I'm doing this well in my very first tournament. Knowing... One move. That's it. And then he gets to the final match, the fifth and final match. And it's this guy. Now I say guy because this 10-year-old boy now has to face this teenager that's almost 18 years old. And to him, that's a man. And he's looking at this guy. And even, even the referee calls a timeout. The, the, I don't know what they're called, the referee, whatever it is. He calls a timeout and he, and he, goes, he goes, we cannot let this match happen. That guy is going to kill that boy. Like, there's just no way. And the sensei runs up and he says, what are you doing? He says, this is his right. Let him do it. And the referee says, if he gets hurt, it's on you. He says, he says whatever. And sure enough, dude, that boy, he gets whooped. Like, and it's almost, it's almost over. And this is where I'm really like karate kid status now. You know what I mean? Um, it's like, you know, and he's like, he's getting whooped. And the sister says, do your move. And sure enough, that, that kid runs in and he messes up. And the 10-year-old boy grabs him and does the one move that he knows and completely takes the guy out. And he wins the tournament. And he's dumbfounded absolutely dumbfounded and everybody's cheering for him and all this stuff it's like the one art boy wins the tournament you know does all this type of thing and as he's driving home with the sensei he literally the boy asks the sensei he goes how in the world can I win a tournament 
against people that are bigger and stronger than me, only knowing one move. And the sensei looks at him and he says, you won for two reasons. One, you practiced that one move so many times that you have mastered the hardest throw in judo. You're a master in this throw. Two, the only known defense in this throw is to grab the opponent's arm, which he does not have. He says, that's how you won. And then it goes on and it talks about making your weaknesses your strengths. And recognizing that maybe what you see as a downfall is not actually your downfall, but could actually be your greatest weapon. Only God knows what we can do, right? As long as you keep saying yes to him and keep moving forward, right? And that's what we've been talking about in hope. Keep moving forward. Don't stop. Let's see what God can do. Are you all still tracking still? Yes? So I, I, was, I was looking at this and I was like, God, that is so awesome. And I said, I want to remind myself what hope is. And I want to kind of go a little bit review with you guys in this. Hope, if you guys uh, don't remember, is basically this idea in the Hebrew and in the Greek that it's a cord. Hope is a rope, right? And I said, I wanted to cut ropes and give it to y'all, but we're all spread out all over the world, the globe. And I said, but if you can, just remember that hope is a rope, right? And God is tied to the other end of that rope. So no matter what you're going through, know that you can grab onto that rope and he will pull you forward. Yes? Then hope, if you want to go to Webster's, like, you know, Webster, it says this, and I found this to be super fascinating. It says hope is an expectation and desire for a certain thing to happen. It's a trust of or in something. And when I read that, it, it, it stopped me dead in my tracks. Because hope, we get the expectation part of it, right? It's an expectation. It's a desire. But a trust of or in something. So I don't know about you. Like I've heard of, you know, hope we know about, but that's a definition, right? And then trust. Now, you know what trust is, but have you ever defined trust? It's a little harder to define, right? When you have a five-year-old or a four-year-old and they ask you what all these words mean, you have like simple words that you just know that you thought you knew, but you don't know how to define and then you can only define it with a word, right? Yet, you see some parents in here like, yeah, I know what you're talking about, right? So I'm sitting here, I was like, what is trust? It's like, well, you, 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 you trust somebody. You just, you just, you do, you, you trust. And I was sitting there, I was like, what is trust? This is how trust is defined. I found it. it is a conviction in the reliability, ability, and strength of someone or something. Now, I love this. It's the conviction. Not a belief. A belief has no evidence, right? Conviction means that there's evidence proving. So that means when we trust somebody or we trust something, that there's actual evidence of their reliability, of their ability, and of their strength. Yes? So the question is, do you trust God? That's going to be ultimately where we're going to head today. But check this out. The story that I just gave you about the 10-year-old boy Missing his arm. He had to trust in the sensei. Even though the sensei was only teaching him one move. And the sensei never told him why. He had to have trust. Why? Because he knew that the sensei knew what he was talking about. There's reliability there. He knows that the sensei obviously can do judo and knows he has the ability. And obviously if he is, a, is, is the top of his game, the sensei is, he must have the strength to be there. Does that make sense? And so this is like, when I was thinking about it, I was like, man, the trust that we have to have. And I started thinking about it. I was like, oh my gosh, this is why the world lacks hope. Because we don't know how to trust anybody anymore. Oh, it's real quiet, but I see a lot of nodding heads. We don't know how to trust anybody. And now if all of a sudden I come in and I'm like, you're supposed to trust God, right? You need to trust God. And you're like, I've never met God. I've never seen God. I've never touched God. That's because you have a belief, but you don't have a conviction yet. Yes? You need to be convicted. Where's your evidence? What have you seen happen? 
Yeah? And here's what I learned about hope this week. Everybody loves the good outcome. Hope only works in our culture and in our society when you become the victor. So let me give you a story because I know a lot of you guys are like, oh, what are you talking about? Let me walk you through this, okay? We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 13 and 14. This is going to be a review for some of you all, but just walk with me, okay? Let me give you the imagery of what's going on because I'm not going to read the whole thing to you because it will be boring and I see a lot of you are already tired, okay? The turkey is kicking in. Okay, so watch it. Here's how it works. They basically just named a king. They named a king of Israel. They used to have these judges that were doing a fine job. But what happened was, is the people started to grumble because all these other nations had these kings. They had one person to look to. But not Israel. No, Israel had all these judges. And you know who those judges were listening to? God. Because they had their trust in God. And so these judges would listen to God and they would tell, they would give an outcome to something. And the people started grumbling, saying, we want to be just like everybody else. Give us a king. And so they picked a king. And his name was Saul. And he was tall. He was rugged. He was handsome. This is not me talking. This is the Bible, okay? He was a hottie, okay? So some of you ladies are like, no, I don't know about it. Yeah, he, it's Fabio, okay? Fabio, and that's for the older people, okay? It's just amazing. He's got his, his hair, he whips it back, and he's like, hello, right? The greatest thing is, you know where they found Saul? He's a donkey herder or farmer. That's right, a donkey. And now, if there wasn't a bunch of kids, I would use the old name for a donkey, and that's what he was doing, Right? He's just hanging out with a bunch of donkeys all the time. And God goes, yeah, that's the guy that I want to run Israel. Right? Because he knows how to deal with donkeys all the time. You guys are walking in this, right? Now, he was a man after God's heart. Let's just be real. Saul was picked because he, he loved the Lord. He was outstanding. It's not like he was just some random guy. God knew who he was, and he knew who God was. But guess what happens? When you give somebody power, yeah. they start to do things on their own and in their own power, no longer in the power of God. Did you catch that? Because that's when hope starts to disappear, is when we think we could do it on our own. Remember, one of the things that hope do or needs is trust. It's really hard to trust yourself if you're in a hopeless moment. You gotta trust somebody else. Are you still walking with me? And guess what? That's what happened with Saul. There's this moment that he was, he was supposed to wait for uh, Samuel to come and do an offering and he didn't wait for Samuel to come and do the offering because you know what he said? He says, this is a, we, we have to do this and we have to do this now. And he, and he did a sacrifice and guess what? God looked at that and said, what were you thinking? And all of a sudden, this Philistine army comes over the mountain. And now there is this battle that is going to take place. The problem is, is the Philistines have the high ground. And the Israelites have another high ground. And there's a valley right in the middle. And it's a stalemate. It's a stalemate for a while. We're not talking about a day or two or three. We're talking, this walks into weeks. Maybe, it doesn't tell us specifically, maybe even months. They are just standing there and they're like, you make a move. No, you make a move, right? And they all, they're just looking at each other. Here's the problem. Israel is hopeless in this situation. The Philistines outnumber them two to one. The Philistines have the numbers. The Philistines have the high ground. And the Philistines have all of the blacksmiths. What does that mean? That Israel has no weapons. In order for them to get weapons, they have to go down into the valley and ask the Philistines to give them a weapon. I don't know if you guys have like, you know, ever like read up on battles or wars. That's not what you do. You don't go to the enemy and be like, can I borrow some things? Are you guys with me on this one? 
And this is what has to happen. And so Saul is sitting back in this cave and he's trying to figure life out. He's trying to figure out what he's going to do. Now Saul has a son and the son's name is Jonathan. Now Jonathan is pacing back and forth and he can't understand what they are waiting for. He goes, I get it. We don't have the weapons. I get it. They have the high ground. I get it. We are outnumbered. But why are we waiting here? Either God's for us or he's not. And he has this classic line in, in 1 Samuel chapter 14. And it says this. I want to read it to you. It says, John then says to his young armor bearer, Come, let us go over to the outpost of the uncircumcised men or the unclean men. Perhaps the Lord will act in our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord um, from saving, whether by many or by few. Just stop right there. Jonathan looks at his armor bearer and he says, Listen, man, I can't stay here anymore. We can't do this. We either believe in God or we don't. We're either convicted that God is for us or that he's against us. But the only way we're ever going to know is if we go to the mountain and we go to the Philistines. And I got to, ooh. And in my head, this is the church. Because why? Jonathan didn't do it by himself. He had to do it with what? With somebody. This is not Jonathan by himself. This is Jonathan with his armor bearer. It's somebody that he trusts. Somebody that, 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 that would be, keep him accountable. Somebody that was there for him. And this is what his armor bearer says. He says, do all that you have in your mind. His armor bearer said, go ahead. I am with you heart and soul. And I love this moment because I'm like, this is the church. This should be what church looks like. When there's a member in the church that says, I feel like the Lord is asking me to do this, then the, these people, the church, the community, the believers, the people should come around them and say, let's do all that you have in your mind. We're with you, heart and soul. Let's go after this. Not by yourself, but together. Yes? yes. See, to me, that's what brought hope to Jonathan. Not just the idea of if God's for us and who could be against us, let's just go and take on this army right now. Let's do this. Can you imagine doing that by yourself? He's like looking in a mirror. Yeah, okay. No, he looked at his armor bearer. He's like, yeah. And the armor bearer, basically what he's doing, he's, this is, <laughs> this is that, the, the, you know, like the, the sounding board. Am I stupid? Am I stupid for doing this? Am I stupid for saying this? And the armor bearer, no. Jonathan. I'm with you. You're right. If God is for us, then it doesn't matter how many we are. He's going to provide. So I'm with you. Heart and soul. What do we need to do? And it goes on. So what do we need to do? He says, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go down into the valley. And then when we go to the outpost and we see them on the high, the high spot, if they look down at us, and they call us out, and they come down to us, we know that the Lord is not for us. And it was really good knowing you. Because we're about to die. That's it. We're dead. But, hmm, but, if we go down there, and they see us, and they call us up to them, we know that the Lord has delivered them into our hands. And the armor bearer. Okay, cool. Let's go. Did you, did you guys, I don't know if you guys heard that or not, what I just said. Because this is a moment where it's like, listen, if we do this, you're probably going to die. Are you good? Do you know that in our, in, in, in our culture, in our society, we are so prideful and so selfish that if it doesn't benefit us, we don't hang out with people. We won't help people out if it doesn't benefit us. It has to benefit us, otherwise we don't do it. You don't believe me, I encourage you, look at the friends that you have and why do you have them? What do they provide for you? And if you don't have friends, get some and then ask the question, <laughs> right? The reality is 
Most of us have people in our lives because they give us a benefit of some, some way or some sort, right? Because what do we always say? What is the number one thing that, that most psychology, and well, not really psychology, but most, like, um, I want to say, um, inspiration, motivational, that's what I was thinking. Motivational speakers, what do they say? Get rid of the people that suck you dry, right? They don't give you anything, so just cut them off from your life and let them do what they got to do. Right? That's what we hear all the time. You know what I mean? How many friends do you have that are like, hey, we're going to go die today? You, you in? <laughs> you going to do this? Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird, this is literally what's going on, you guys. This is literally what's happening in this story. In this account, this is what's happening. And it's weird. But sometimes we need to have those people in our life that stretch us, that pull us, that make us go to, a, to another level in our lives. Yes? Yeah. I know this is a hard thing. Listen, I know it's hard. I, I, but I could only imagine the armor bearer in the story. Right? The armor bearer is sitting here, and he's just like, I guess today's a good day to die. Let's go. But he has so much conviction and trust in Jonathan, he's like, we could do this. Let's do it together. There was no evidence that God was going to give them a victory. They just did it. What did they have? Hope. That was it. And then the moment comes. They're literally hiding behind a bush. And then they stand up. The Philistines up on the mountain see them. And they yell down. Look! <laughs> Israel's finally crawling out of their holes. <laughs> you two! Get up here! Smile! What, is it? what do they know in that moment? The Lord has delivered them into our hands. And as they start climbing up, their hope, their confidence, um, their encouragement starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And as they reach the top of this mountain, this, 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 uh, this cliff, if you will, as they reach the top of it, they get out their sword, the one sword, by the way, that they have. They get out the one sword and they kill 20 men right then and there. Just boom, slaughters them. He's like, woo, right? Now, I want, this is only God, only God, only God, right? As they kill those 20 guys, the Philistines start screaming. They're here, they're attacking, and these guys are running out of their tents not knowing what's going on. Are you with me on this one? They are in a desert. As they start running, you have literally hundreds and hundreds of men scrambling to try to find their what? Their weapons and try to get ready for battle because they were not ready for this at all. And the dust starts to come up and now there starts to be a panic and then God's like this. Let's see what happens when I do an earthquake. Boom! The earth starts to shake and now all the Philistines are scared out of their mind and guess what they start doing? Stabbing anything that comes near them. They literally start stabbing each other. A, because they can't see their dust everywhere. B, there's a panic going on. And they're just trying to get out of the way. And I, I just said, this is the moment where like when I preach this, I, I always see it like this. I see like Jonathan with his sword and his armor bearer. They're like back to back. And they're like, let's do this. And then all of a sudden they just look and they're like, are they killing each other? <laughs> yeah, I think that dude just stabbed that other guy. What do we do? Let's just stand here and see what happens. After the 20 guys that they, that, they, that they got to first, they didn't kill anybody else. They just watched the Philistines destroy themselves. And guess what happens? Somebody yells, hey, Saul. Yes, yeah, Saul. Um, the, there's something going on at the Philistine camp. And he looks out there. And I don't know the binocular. I don't you know, little tell, I don't know what he has. They look out there and they're like, oh, dude, somebody's fighting them. Oh, they're fighting. Somebody's going to. And he goes like this. He goes, he goes, count everybody. Count everybody. See who we're missing. And they count everybody real quick and they're like, we're missing two guys. Jonathan and his armor bearer. And he goes, my son? We're missing my son? And he goes, get an army together and go. And sure enough, they start charging. They go, and they start charging. By the time they get there, the Philistines have literally, um, they, they've escaped, they've run away, or they have killed themselves. So by the time they got there, this is how I can imagine it, is like, you know, John, uh, Jonathan's sitting there with his, like, his, like, you know, sword on his shoulder and his armor bearer standing next to him, like, way to join the party. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, what's up? You guys missed it. It was pretty cool. You guys should have been here. Right? And what's the testimony of that? Why were you waiting, Saul? Dad, why were you waiting? 
Either God is for us or he's against us. But we got to know and we've got to take some risks sometimes. Right? I tell you that entire story. I count. Because there's victory. Right? We love stories with victory. The 10-year-old boy with the missing arm wins a judo tournament. Victory. Yes! Jonathan is our bear. If God is for us, who could be against us? Victory. Yes! The problem is, the problem that we have, hope doesn't care about the outcome. <laughs> hope does not care about the outcome. Hope does not mean that you're going to be victorious. And that's the hard part that we have to live with. One of my favorite accounts in all of Scripture, Matthew chapter 11. And I usually preach on it once a year, and I haven't done it yet, so I thought this was the perfect time to do it. Matthew 11. Let me set the scene for you. John the Baptist who has prepared the way for the Messiah, Jesus Christ, to come. He found himself in Herod's prison. And he doesn't know what's about to happen to him. But he does know this. In the palace, in Herod's palace, they don't like him. I guess when you tell the king that you're not allowed to sleep with your sister's sister, or however it works, or your, sister, or your brother's wife, however that works, he didn't, get, he didn't like that. They were really mad at him for that. What did he do? He just told him the truth. Hey, God doesn't like that. You probably shouldn't do that. He's like, forget you. I'm going to throw you in prison. But this is what I, the reason why he's not dead is because Herod was scared of him. He's like, I think he really knows God. And if I kill him, I think God's going to come against me. So I'm not going to kill him. I'll just let him rot in prison. And so now John the Baptist, ready? The ministry that John the Baptist did freely for years, if not decades, he doesn't get to do anymore. And instead, he is hopeless, rotting in prison. While his cousin, Jesus, gets to go and do all these great things. And John the Baptist is hearing about all these amazing things that are happening. And he gets frustrated and he sends out some of his disciples and he tells them this. And this is where he pick up Matthew chapter 11. Uh, says this, when John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to, to ask him, are you the one who is to come or should we expect another? Or should we expect somebody else? This is John the Baptist. The one that saw Jesus coming up over a hillside and he says, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The man who will baptize you with fire is here. I am not worthy to even tie his sandals. He's asking this question to him. The one that told everybody, this is him. The one that got to see God's hand in the form of a dove lay upon Jesus and said, this is my son who I am well pleased. This guy is asking, are you the one that is to come or should we expect another? Because you want to know what's going on? Is right here, he's frustrated. I am in prison and I am about to die probably and you're out doing ministry. What about me? Do you see the hopelessness here? Are you really the one that is to come? Or should we expect another? And Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. I'm going to put this in today's terms. Jesus, I thought we were in this together. Jesus, I have done everything that, the God, that, that your father has ever asked of me. And now I'm rotting in prison and I am about to die. What are you going to do about it, Jesus? And Jesus comes back and he says, 
John, what are you complaining about? The blind see, the dead are raised, the lepers are cleansed, the kingdom of God is at hand. John, what's wrong? Are you offended by where I have you? And Jesus has to turn the crowd. What does he say? Blessed is the one that is not offended by me. Here's the next thing uh, that Jesus goes through and he says. He says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing, if you are willing, maybe next, no, to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling out to, to uh, uh, one another. We played the pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating, uh, neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man uh, came eating and drinking, and they say he is a glutton and a drunkard and a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Craig, what did that all mean? Check this out. This is basically, he's giving John the Baptist so much credit. He's saying, listen, John the Baptist was the most amazing man. He's knowing what's about to happen. He's an amazing man. There's been none born of women like him. If you accept it, he was the one that, was, that is the Elijah. The one that is to come and to prepare the way for the Messiah. Which is me. But how can I compare this generation? Look, we tried to celebrate with you in the marketplaces. And you would not celebrate with us. And when we tried to mourn with you, you wouldn't even mourn with us. So I'm asking you the question. What are we doing here? He came not eating, not drinking, and you're like, he's demon possessed. I came and I was eating and drinking and you're like, oh, he's a sinner. Listen, you want to know what's right? Actions. Wisdom is proved right by her deeds. I want us to get this. Hope needs to become an action. John, I'm not coming to save you. Do you still love me? John, what is, what is greater? That you get to be with me in eternity? Or that I come and get you out of prison right now? What is greater? Which is greater? Here is my final thought process in this. That we need to recognize. I gave you two accounts. One, victory. One, death. Right? One is the outcome that we all want. When we talk about hope, I want hope. I want this amazing outcome. And that outcome doesn't happen. What do we do? We blame everybody else. We start to blame. We start to, to, to get disheartened. We're like, God doesn't exist. I hoped in him. I believed in God. And I never got healed from my cancer. I never got healed from the vid or the COVID. I never got healed from this. And, it, and as I was thinking about this, this is what came to my mind. Hope is not rooted in the overcoming of a situation. Hope is rooted in your trust in God and the people he surrounds you with in and after the situation. Jonathan's hope wasn't that God was going to give him a victory. Jonathan's hope was that he didn't go to death by himself. The armor bearer was not certain that he was going to live. But he trusted in what Jonathan was doing. Do you see that God brought somebody to them both? John the Baptist, if you haven't figured it out, even though he was in prison, did he not get to talk to his disciples? Was he not still in communication with people? He wasn't by himself. Did you catch that? 
God surrounded him with people. And even Jesus in that moment was trying to comfort John the Baptist, even though he knew the outcome and what it would be. So today, I want us to recognize this. Hope doesn't necessarily have to be the outcome that you were looking for. Maybe hope is the person or the people that God has surrounded you with to help you get through the situation. We are not promised another day on this planet. Is death punishment? Is death the end for us? Because if it is, then maybe we're, we're looking at life the wrong way. Maybe we need to look at life through the people that we surround ourselves with. This is why the church is so important. This is why we gather on Sundays. This is why we have venues, even though we don't have a building to go in yet. This is why we do this. Why? Because we have to surround ourselves with the believers. We have to surround ourselves with one another and have hope. Especially if those in the church are hopeless. We need to surround them and bring hope to them. Why? Because it's about being together. Once again, maybe it's about trusting in those around us. Trusting in the Lord. So today, my one thought process in all of this craziness that's going on in our nation and our world right now. What if we're looking for an outcome and we shouldn't be looking for an outcome? We should be looking at the people around us and how we can help the people around us. Did that make sense? What if your calling isn't the outcome of something, but it's just to be there for the person next door, your neighbor? What if? So today, I want us to get a different view of what hope might actually be. Maybe we need to step back and say, I'm done looking for an outcome. I'm really, now I'm ready to start seeing what God is truly doing with me, around me, through me, in me. Amen? Amen. And here's the last thing. This is why it's so important not to neglect the church. Not to neglect the church is not a building. It's not a place. It's a people. It's who we surround ourselves with. And just maybe, when you go to church, you will connect yourself with somebody that will continue, that you can trust in and hope in. And it will bring something amazing to your life. Friendship. Family. Isn't that what God came to preach anyways? So what is hope? It's a good question, don't you think? So let's keep looking at it. Um, and diving into it. Because um, not only is hope not the outcome, but it could be people. In a few days, we're going to talk about that hope is a person. Amen? Amen. So, get ready, Christmas. All right. <laughs> With that said, I'm going to pray. And as I pray, um, I'm going to invite up... Um, our guest worship leader uh, today is uh, Jake Hamilton. Um, uh, he's a guest to you. He's family to me. Um, we don't get to have him down uh, as often as, as, as we used to when we used to actually live together. Um, but um, I love what God has done uh, with and through my brother. Um, this man uh, gets to do amazing things around the world. He has seen amazing things. And um, honestly, I'm, I'm proud of him. Um, and I'm glad that um, this message, that God surrounds you with people, I'm glad I get to be surrounded by him and his family and what God is doing through him and with him. And so um, today, as we uh, just enter into worship, let's just remind ourselves maybe who God put in our lives. Remind ourselves... Um, what's around us. Maybe we need to just say, God, it's no longer about an outcome. It's about people. It's about you, Father. And I put all trust in you. So Father, 
Bless the next few moments in our, in our service. Show up in a mighty way, Father God, as we love on you and we worship you and as we praise you. And all that agreed said... All we want is your 
your presence. All we want is your presence, Lord. All we want is your presence. God. We want is your presence, God. All we want is your presence, God. All we want is your presence, Lord. All we want is your presence. All we want is your presence, God. All we want is your presence. All we want is your presence, Lord. All we want is your presence. All we want is your presence, God. All we want is your presence. All we want is your presence, Lord. All we want is your presence. All we want is your presence, Lord. All we want is your presence. All we want is your presence, Lord. All we want is your presence. All we want is your presence. All we want, Lord. Oh, na na na. All we want is your presence, Lord. All we want is your presence, Lord. All we want is your presence, Lord. Sing that again. 
only one God, Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, there's only one throne and there's only one king and there's only one God and there's only one name, Jesus. Jesus. There's only one throne and there's only one king and there's only one God and there's only one name, Jesus. Jesus. Yes, there's only one throne and there's only one king and there's only one God and there's only one name, Jesus. Jesus. Everybody wants a savior, but nobody wants a king. Everybody wants a savior, but nobody wants a king. Oh, everybody wants to be saved, but nobody wants to bow a knee. A knee. Everybody wants a savior, but nobody wants a king. Everybody wants a savior. Nobody wants a king. Everybody wants to be saved, but nobody wants to bow a knee. A knee. But there's only one throne, and there's only one king, and there's only one God, and there's only one name, Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, there's only one throne, and there's only one king, and there's only one God, and there's only one name, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, yes, there's only one throne, and there's only one king, and there's only one God, and there's only one name, Jesus, Jesus, and you did not put him on the throne, so you cannot vote him off, no, you did not put him on the throne, so you cannot vote him off, no, you did not put him on the throne, so you cannot vote him off, his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Everybody wants a savior, but nobody wants a king. Everybody wants a savior, but nobody wants a king. Oh, everybody wants to be saved, but nobody wants to bow a knee. Just bow your knee. That's what you do before a king, you bow your knee. You bow a knee. You bow a knee, bow a knee, bow a knee. Bow a knee. And I fall. As your glory shines around, and yes, I fall face down. As your glory shines around, and yes, I fall face down. As your glory shines around, yes, I fall. Song. So let's all 
agree we should all get along. We have no idea what we're doing. There's a road, and there is a road that's less traveled upon. If there is a lover, then there is a song. So let's all agree we should all get along. We have no idea what we're All I can 
trust you. We trust you. We trust you. We trust you. So God, no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter what the outcomes will be, we will bend a knee to you and we will trust you knowing that our hope is in you and you alone. So Holy Spirit, continue to do a work and a wonder. Um, in our region, in this world. And God, as we do our best to seek you and love you, hold us close. Let us know that we're going to get through this. So Father, we just praise you, we love you, and we thank you. And all that agreed said, Amen. 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 Amen.